We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. All right, good morning, Point family. How we doing this morning? Awesome, not bad, not bad. Um, Good to see everybody. Welcome to The Point, and I want to welcome all of our guests today. We're so glad that you're spending the morning with us and so glad that you are here. And I also want to take a moment and welcome all of you who are joining us live online for worship as well this morning. If those of us in the room could just take a moment and welcome everybody joining us live online. Let them know how excited you are. They are joining us. And... um, A lot of times we can sit in here and forget that there are hundreds, if not more, that are watching online, that are worshiping online with us every Sunday morning from all over the place. And so we are so glad that you're joining with us today as well. Um, Because only half of you uh, were in the room when Stu opened up the service this morning, um, that's my kind of uh, passive aggressive way of telling you to get here on time. Hey, um, I got to echo his words. We just want to take a moment and we want to say congratulations to our University of Virginia men's basketball team (laughs) on a national championship. That is insane, isn't it? A national championship. Congratulations to all of you guys and uh, to everybody connected with the athletics department there and and the whole university, just such a cool, cool thing to see. And congratulations uh, to you. And I wanna take a moment and echo his words as well. I loved how um, you weren't in the room, but when Stu like dropped the Easter bomb um, after he congratulated the men's team. And so he was like, and then how excited are we for the resurrection next Sunday? You get his point, right? (laughs) No, it was awesome. And anyways, next Sunday, Easter with the point, okay? And we're doing Easter from Israel. It's gonna be amazing the whole morning. You don't wanna miss, okay, from the the very beginning. It's gonna be moments of the service. We're gonna be kind of going back and forth from one location. It's gonna be an awesome, awesome morning. So I hope you're here. Make sure you're getting invites out this week. Every year, so many stories of life change because people invited people on Easter Sunday. Did you know, statistics are very clear that many people who would not go to church any other time of the year, they're open to attending on Christmas and at Easter. And so don't say no for somebody. Don't just assume they don't want the invite, okay? Let them tell you no, okay? And I promise you, you'll be okay if they say no. But what if they say yes? I said it last week. Stop asking what could go wrong. Start asking what could go right if I extend the invitation, okay? What could go right is it could change their eternity. What could go right is it could save their marriage, what could go right is it could begin to be, be the beginning steps of putting a family back together, all right? So stop worrying about what could go wrong. Start asking what could go right and take a few minutes today, pick up some invites as you leave. So this morning, we're gonna be in part two of a very short series from Israel. And before we go into the time in the word, I just wanna ask you to bow your hearts and minds with me. And we're gonna come before the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you that we have this privilege of worshiping you today, of God lifting our voices in worship, and God, how that prepared our heart for this moment where your word is gonna go forth. And God, I pray that today you would accomplish your purposes with your word. God, move in our hearts, move in my heart, God. I don't wanna go through the motions of just preaching a message. God, I wanna leave here changed. And so I ask you to begin right here in my heart. I pray that same prayer would be lifted up over this auditorium. God, change me. Speak to me and change me, Lord. I want to leave different. I pray that that same prayer would be lifted up in every home, um, every car where this is being watched online. May you speak to their hearts this morning, God. Change us. Make us more like you. God, bless us with your presence. Change us, Lord, through the power of your presence. In your presence, we cannot stay the same. God, we cannot. And so we ask for your presence, Lord, just to be so strong, so real this morning as we engage you in your word. Holy Spirit, God, I pray that you would not just give us ears to hear, give us the courage to obey what it is you say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So this morning, as we get ready for Easter from Israel, we're part two of this series from Israel. And today I'm gonna be taking you to the Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane. Last week we were on the Sea of Galilee. Today we are in the Garden of Gethsemane. And more specifically, I wanna teach today on the topic of, say it with me, pain. pain. The thing that everybody loves to talk about, the topic of pain, and specifically pain as it relates to people. It has been said that people can be the source of your greatest joy, and you've got people that come to your mind. And then it's also been said that the same people can become the source of your greatest pain as well. And we've got people that come to to our mind. Sometimes those people are the same people, right? Like your toddler, okay, great example. Uh, Your teenager, right? We've all got people like this in our lives. And today as we talk about this topic of pain, what I wanna do is begin in the Old Testament as we dive into the story of King David. And specifically, one of the most difficult seasons of pain that David experiences as king over over Israel. So I want you to look with me today at 2 Samuel chapter number 15. 2 Samuel 15, and we're beginning this morning with verse number 12. While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he also sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor, to come from Gilo, his hometown. And so the conspiracy gained strength. Let me read that again. The conspiracy gained strength. Okay, there's trouble that's brewing. There's drama that's being stirred up. And Absalom's following kept on increasing. Somebody say, "Uh uh-oh. Uh Uh-oh. Now, as we step into the story of David's pain, okay, I don't want to overgeneralize pain, but I do want to point out really kind of two sources that we can kind of trace our pain back to, okay? There's some pain that we experience in life that comes from circumstances. Some pain comes from circumstances. Job said in Job 14, one, man, or you could also include woman, that's born of a woman, which means all of us, is a few days and full of trouble, meaning that it doesn't take long in life for you to encounter pain, okay? And pain, some pain, comes as a result of the circumstances that we um, encounter in, in life, all right? When, when, I, when I think about this, it could be that, you know, you're experiencing pain from a diagnosis, okay? You got news from the doctor. There's pain that you're experiencing as, as a result of that. There's some pain that just, just comes because circumstances come our way and, and life just happens. And we think about the story of Job, We know that his pain behind it, that the enemy had requested of God to test Job's faith. And as a result of that testing, Job experienced an incredible amount of pain, more pain than most of us, even some of us who've been through the hardest things will even encounter in our lifetime. And so his pain was not because of anything he was doing wrong. His pain was because of what he was doing right. Think about that before you tap out the next time you go through a season of pain. Like it could be that you're doing all the right things. It's not because of anything that you have done wrong. But there's also some pain that we experience in life as a result of our choices. A lot of times we can overlook this or we like to forget about this, but you know that there are consequences that come as a result of choices that we make. It's just the fact of the matter. And when I think about this, like I think about how, for example, Let's say that what she said about you or what she did to you, like, no, it probably wasn't nice or it wasn't right. But instead of just overlooking the offense, you decide to like air it all out on Facebook. And what would have just blown over, now all of a sudden turns out, it turns into this huge relational fallout and blow up and the whole world knows about it, right? That's what I'm saying. Rather than handling it in God's way, like you make a choice to handle it the wrong way and then it blows up and there's pain as as a result of that. Sometimes it's pain from the choices that we make. Sometimes the pain that we experience is, is, is because of choices that others have made that affect us. There are a lot of you this morning, you are experiencing pain because of a choice that your spouse has made. And it stinks and it's hard, isn't it? Some of you are experiencing pain because of decisions that your parents made a long, long time ago or grandparents made. And what happens is is like this generational thing keeps getting passed down and passed down and passed down. And we talked about that before, like why not let us be the generation that stops it? 
right? But sometimes the pain that we experience is because of decisions that others meet, have made that affect us. Like take, for example, like the decision that impacted everybody in the room and everybody online was thousands of years ago, Adam and Eve made a choice in the garden to disobey God. And here we are today, and we got a lot of mess out of that, right? This is what I'm, what I'm talking about. And so sometimes pain comes from the choices that we make. Now, when we look at King David's life and this season of pain, as you read 2 Samuel, you get a picture that the pain that David is experiencing is because of both, both circumstances and because of choice. I say circumstance because David was following King Saul and King Saul's leadership over Israel. Like David didn't choose that. That's what God chose for him. You know, there's a saying in the world of coaching, you don't follow the legend, you follow the guy that follows the legend. Right? Did you guys get that? Like, like for, take for example, like God forbid, but if like Tony Bennett were now to like, to like move on, right? I wouldn't want to follow him in coaching. All right? I would follow the guy who would follow him. Like you don't follow, the le- but, but you follow the guy who follows the legend. Here's what I'm saying is Saul was by no means a legend, but he was the only king that Israel had ever known up until that point. And there were a lot of people in Israel who were still loyal only to Saul's leadership. And so David had that as an issue that he had to lead through. But there were also choices that David made that brought on this season of pain. Like back in 2 Samuel chapter 11, what we read is a story and Samuel opens up the chapter by saying, it was a time when kings go off to war, but David stayed behind. Setting us up for a picture here of a decision, a choice that David's gonna make that's not honoring to God. And what happens one evening, he's out on the rooftop and he spots a beautiful woman bathing. She's naked and he's very attracted to her and he calls for her to come to him and he sleeps with her and she gets pregnant. Uh Uh-oh, what does David now do? In an attempt to cover up his sin, he calls her husband, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, off of the battlefield, brings him back home. He tries to arrange for them to sleep together to cover up his sin, and, and Uriah refuses. Like, he has more integrity than David has. Uriah refuses, and this presents another problem for David. Now, how do I I cover this up? So he sends Uriah back to battle with plans to have Uriah killed in battle. And so now David's an an adulterer and he's a murderer. Like David was, was a great king, but in no stretch was he perfect. But that wasn't it. It was two chapters after that that we read how David had a son named Amnon who was attracted to the sister of, a, of his other son, Absalom. And Amnon raped the sister of Absalom. And what did David do? While it infuriated him, he did nothing about it, thus enabling the behavior of his son. Now, let me just say this about enabling and behavior. Boundaries are not a bad thing that you need to put on people. I've said this a couple of months ago, I wanna say it now, that boundaries do not reject people, they, they reject behaviors. And it could be the boundaries that you need to set for someone you love, it could be the very thing that could save their life. David's failure to put a boundary around, around Amnon's behavior, what happens? Absalom gets bitter and angry, as would any of us, and he actually takes matters into his own hands and he kills Amnon. Not only that, that bitterness in David's heart towards, or excuse me, Absalom's heart towards his father, David, it begins to grow and it turns into full-fledged resentment. The resentment is so bad that it leads Absalom into an uprising and an attempt to overthrow his father, David. That, all of that that I just told you about is behind what we're reading in verse number 12. So circumstance and choice of David. And look at this. Let me read it again. While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he also sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor, to come from Gilo, his hometown. And so now Absalom has gotten one of David's most trusted um, sources of wisdom and counsel to join into the conspiracy. And so the conspiracy gained strength and Absalom's following kept on increasing. Verse 13, and a messenger came and told David, the hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. And you can imagine with this news, you can imagine David's heart just sinking. If you've ever been betrayed, 
by someone you love and you care about that meant a lot to you, you know what David is right now experiencing. In verse 14 says, then David said to all of his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, come, we must flee or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. The king's officials answered him, your servants are ready to do whatever our Lord, the king chooses. And so what does David choose to do in the face of the betrayal? He, turned, he chooses to flee the city. And it says this in verse 23, the whole countryside wept aloud as the people passed by and the king also crossed. Now this is an important geographical reference here, the Kidron Valley and all the people moved toward the wilderness. So let me quickly paint a picture for you. G um, David David is going to leave the city of Jerusalem and his palace. He's going to descend down the eastern side of the city. And we're only talking here about 100 to 150 yards. And he's going to enter into the Kidron Valley. And then he's going to ascend up the other side that's facing the city and move on into the wilderness. And verse 24 says this, Zadok was there too. And all the Levites who were with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. And they set down the Ark of God and Abiathar offered sacrifice sacrifices until all the people had finished leaving the city. And then the king said to Zadok, take the ark of God back into the city. And if I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it and his dwelling place again. But if he says, I'm not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. And here's what I want you to notice is the posture of David's heart. It's no longer, we're not covering this up anymore. He get, you, get, you get the feeling as you read this, he understands that where he's at, the pain that he's in is in part to these decisions that he's made in his past. And what we see here is a level of brokenness in David's heart in response to God. It's almost as if he says this, look, I can't control what happens on the horizontal plane with Absalom, but I can control right now the posture of my heart vertically with God. Are you with me? It's a level of surrender and brokenness to the will of God. And while seasons of pain are never fun, what they do is they do position our heart in such a way that we cannot experience that same level of intimacy and connection with God that we could when, when things are just going well and when everything's going perfectly. We see here a true level of humility and surrender and brokenness before God. So let me make this point. Somebody needs to hear this this morning. But the mistakes that you've made, the choices you've made in your life do not have to have the final word. I know what it's like when I talk about choices for a lot of you to sit out this morning and think, man, if I could go back and undecide what I decided, I would. And you can't. And it stinks and it's hard. But let me just encourage you that that choice you made, it does not have to have the final word on your life. Your failure does not have to be fatal. And it doesn't have to be final. That right now in this season, you have a prime opportunity to realign your heart and to reconnect with the heart of God. To allow the brokenness of this season to reconnect you in a way that maybe you haven't experienced in a long time. To return to your first love. To fall in love with Jesus all over again. We see that happening with David. Now I want you to jump down with me to verse number 30. But David continued, look at this, up the Mount of Olives. So he left the city, descended into the Kidron Valley, and then he ascends up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered, and as he was bare, and he was barefoot, and all the people with him covered their heads too, and were weeping as they went up. So David, in the face of betrayal, he flees the city and he goes out into the wilderness. Now, I want to step next into the New Testament where we look at the greatest season of pain in the life and the ministry of Jesus. I want you to turn with me right now to Luke chapter 22. Jesus is with his disciples and he is sharing with them the Passover meal. And it says this in verse number 19, and he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. In other words, he's telling his disciples, I am the fulfillment of what we're celebrating. I'm the fulfillment of the Passover. And then we read this in verse 21. 
but the hand of him who was going to betray me is with mine on the table. And we know that from other gospel accounts, it's during this meal that Judas will leave this dinner and he will go off and he will make arrangements for Jesus to be handed over where he will betray Jesus. Now, at the end of the meal, I want you to look at what happens in verse 39. Jesus went out as usual, where? To the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. And do you know that the trek that Jesus takes from where they're celebrating the Passover to the Mount of Olives, it is the very same path that David would have taken a thousand years before. He would have descended down the eastern side of the city of Jerusalem and he would have crossed over the Kidron Valley and then he would have ascended up the other side. It's interesting when you read the other gospel accounts because the Gospel of John describes the scene of this location where Jesus goes to as an olive grove. And John actually mentions just on the other side of the Kidron Valley. The Gospels of Matthew and Mark, they both call the name of this location where Jesus stops, Gethsemane. Now let me tell you what the name Gethsemane means. Gethsemane means olive or oil press. Now, to help you understand the significance of this, let me tell you the cycle that an olive goes through in order to produce oil. In order for an olive to produce oil, it's as hard as a rock until after the first rain of the rain season. And then once that first rain comes, that olive begins the process of softening, of, of ripening and growing soft. And then after it begins to grow soft, it has a little window of time that you can actually use to extract the oil from olives. And if you don't extract the oil in enough time, the olive gets wasted. It misses its purpose. It misses its window of opportunity to provide oil. Now, do you know how they extract the oil from olives? They have to be crushed. They have to be pressed. Hence the name olive or oil press. Isn't it interesting that Jesus leaves the city, crosses the Kidron Valley, and ascends up the Mount of Olives? Knowing what's ahead of him, he could have kept on going. Knowing the betrayal that he was about to face, he could have kept going up the Mount of Olives and out into the wilderness just as David had done. But what does Jesus do? He stops in the place of crushing he stops in the place of pressure. He stops in the place of, of pressing. Why? Because he has a purpose to fulfill. And it's a purpose that only he can fulfill. If you look with me at verse 40, it says, on reaching the place, he said to them, to his disciples, pray that you will not fall into temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them and he knelt down and prayed. And he prayed this, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Now, let me tell you what the word cup is. It's a metaphor that we see all throughout scripture to represent God's righteous wrath that is poured out on the sin of humanity. Remember that with our sin, there is a price that has to be paid. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is, is death. And by the way, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And every time I quote that verse, people are like, no, not me. Like, yeah, maybe him, maybe her, but not me. You ever thought a bad thought? You ever told a lie? You're a sinner, okay? You say no to both of those, well, you're a liar, okay? And, <laughs> and you're a sinner, you too, all of us, all of us, pastor, even you, me just as much as anybody. Paul said, I'm the chief of all sinners. And because we're sinners, we're in need of a savior. And so here Jesus is in this place of crushing, in the place of pressing with his purpose in front of him. Does he flee? Does he run? No, because he's got this unique little window of time to fulfill the purpose of God in him coming. To die for the sin of the world, 
to take on the cup of the wrath of God that's poured out against all of the sin of humanity. Your sin, my sin, the sin of the world. And so what does he pray? He says, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And what does Jesus do in this place of crushing? Even with the betrayal in his mind, he kneels down and surrender. And what Jesus has determined is this, is that in this moment of pain, my heart has to be aligned with that of my father. It's really easy when you're in pain to get bitter and for resentment to grow, isn't it? Some of you have been carrying resentment for a long time. It's been eating away at your life. In fact, you haven't lived for months or even years. And it keeps creeping back and creeping back and creeping back. It's killing you. It's killing your heart. And it's probably because of something that somebody did that's affected you. Like, we have a lot we can learn from Jesus in this moment. Because while David had to flee the city because of his sin, Jesus, who knew no sin, what does he do? He kneels down and surrender. And look at this in verse 43. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like great drops of blood falling to the ground. In fact, this is a rare medical condition. It's known as hematidrosis. And it's known that when a person is in a severe time of stress and anguish and fear, that it can become so great that blood vessels underneath the skin, they actually burst and blood leaves the body mixed with sweat. This is what Jesus is experiencing. And it says, when he rose from prayer, went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And while he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? King David fled the city in the face of betrayal. King Jesus, he surrenders his will to the will of the Father in the face of betrayal. You know, the price that Jesus Christ will pay for our sin on the cross, when he died on the cross, and he took on the cup of the wrath of God poured out against our sin, when he paid that price for your sin so that you and I would not have to, you know, Jesus is the only one who could do that. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the only way of salvation. He's the only one who can save you from your sin and the only one who can save you from the penalty of your sin, which is spiritual death. He is the only one. But let me say this as well. When it comes to this model that Jesus has given us, is I do believe he's given us a model to follow when we're in the midst of pain. Want a model of surrender and humility to say, Jesus, I don't know what's going to happen. And while we don't on the horizontal plane, I do know that I can choose. And I can't control what's gonna happen on the horizontal plane, can I? But I can choose right now in this moment of pain to align my heart with your heart and to keep it aligned and to keep it fixed on you. And I know you've been through some hard stuff. I get that. But you know what? Jesus is also our model of forgiveness. Now, some of you were with me until I said that word. Because you've been holding on and holding on and holding on to unforgiveness. And if I gave you a few minutes up here and you said, Pastor Gabe, if I could stand up there and tell you what they did, like, I, I get it, okay? I get it completely. Let me be clear on what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not saying that what they did to you is okay. Forgiveness is not excusing their behavior. It's not excusing what they said or what they did. What forgiveness is saying is I'm no longer gonna hold the bill of what they owe me any longer. It's been paid in full and I'm gonna turn it over to God and I'm gonna turn it over to God and I'm gonna trust God with the outcome of this. I can't control him. I can't control her. I can't control how they respond. But I'm gonna hand it over to God. And that's what forgiveness is. 
Look, while they may have hurt you once, like, why are you going to keep letting them hurt you over and over and over again? Because that's what unforgiveness does. You're giving the other person a power over you. And it wasn't right. And, and I get that. But it's time to get free. Like, it's time to open up the prison so that you can go free. Because it's been holding you back. How much longer are you going to do it? And I'm telling you this, when it comes to forgiveness, on this side of obedience, like you're looking at it and you're like, I don't get it. I'm just telling you that when you step through in obedience, God gives you a supernatural power to let go. And I get it. Like I know how hard it is when you're looking at it from this angle, but you step through. And here's the deal, is that what God has called us to, he also empowers us to do it always and he's called us to forgive and he's called us to say I'm not going to hold this bill of what they owe me any longer which by the way they may not deserve it but you and I did not deserve it either when Jesus Christ went to the cross and we don't forgive because they deserve it we forgive because it's what Jesus has told us to do and it's because what he has done for us and that, that is my new power. It's interesting because the oil that was used for olives, obviously it's used for cooking, but you know that it's that same oil that's also used for anointing. And it's sometimes out of our seasons of greatest crushing that our greatest seasons of anointing and power can also come. And I'm just telling you that as you look at your pain this morning, it could be that God has a great story coming out of it. And if you don't like where it is today, let me just encourage you, God's not done yet. He's still working. But your responsibility in this moment is to align your heart with the heart of God. You know, as we wrap up this morning, we're going to um, close with communion. I can think of no better way to respond to the word today than with communion. And let me just say, and be very clear that you don't have to be a member of the point to, or call the point your home to take part in communion with us. But one thing we do ask is that you would honor the word of God. And when I say that, what we read is that communion, it's an ordinance that's reserved for believers, for those who are followers of Jesus. And so if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus as the elements are passed out in just a moment, like, just let them pass by. Like, don't feel because the person beside you is taking part that you have to take part, okay? Because we don't want you to dishonor the word of God in that way. But here's a question I would ask. Why not let today be the day that you become a follower of Jesus? Here in this moment, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus for the first time. And you maybe have taken part in communion your whole life, but today you're gonna pray this prayer and you're gonna take part in it for the very first time as a follower of Jesus Christ. Why not let today be that day? And then I have to believe, there's a lot of us even as followers of Jesus, that maybe there's some things that vertically just aren't on track, they're not right. And it's time to, to right now just surrender those things, to let go of the hurt, to let go of the pain, to let go of the unforgiveness. The Bible says, as we do this for a man to examine himself, and this is your opportunity to do that right now. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning, for your word, for the truth and the power of your word. God, I am fully convinced <laughs> nothing in the world has the power of your word. Your word says that the word of God is alive and active, is sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God, this morning under your word, God, our hearts just feel open. They feel like they've been laid bare and vulnerable before you. God, that's your word at work. And I pray, God, that you would take, Father, spirit and move in the deep places of our heart in those areas that we've set are off limits in those areas that we've never allowed you to touch. God, go into those places today and transform us. I pray especially, Father, for anyone that's here that's never trusted you as Lord and Savior. May today be the day they step from death into life and they cross the line of faith, saying yes to you for the very first time. 
And his heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Everybody's very still and quiet for just a moment. If that's you today, you're ready to say yes to Jesus for the first time. I wanna lead you in a prayer. And I'm gonna ask you to pray this prayer out loud. And I'm gonna ask we would all pray this out loud to support those who are deciding this for the first time today. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. Come into my heart. Cleanse me of my sin. Give me the courage to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.